Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Evans, Executive Director of PhotoFest, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight for the latest in our ongoing series of Creative Conversations Digital, our program that we began in response to the coronavirus crisis, and one that's proved very successful and uh, that we're planning to continue. So um, thanks for joining us, and I think it's going to be a great program tonight. Before I start talking about the program, I did want to thank PhotoFest's major sponsors, the Houston Endowment, the Brown Foundation Incorporated, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, David and Martha Moore, the WWW Foundation, Nina and Michael Zilka, the PhotoFest Board of Directors, and all of the generous contributors to the PhotoFest Annual Fund. Special funding of 10 by 10 was provided by Precision Camera, ATX, and Art Houston Magazine that did a, a very nice spread on the 10 by 10 exhibition if you have a chance to pick up a copy of that. And a complete list of the PhotoFest biennial donors will be shown at the end of the program. I also want to thank the staff uh, that's been working so hard on these, and I haven't had the opportunity to thank them by name in the previous program, so I wanted to thank Associate Curator Max Fields, Communications Director Vinod Hobson, Development Manager Chloe Jolie, um, and Meeting Place Director Marta Sanchez-Philippe, and Meeting Place Associate Director Sarah Ansel also exhibitions coordinator Anique de Kook. So all of them were involved in some way in either setting up the program tonight or setting up the exhibition that happened um, at Silos on Sawyer and will be represented uh, when we are able to fully reopen. Tonight, we've got a conversation between Richard Frischman and Gary Reese. Richard is, from, uh, is living in Washington. And he began his career as a photojournalist and was well recognized for that work, um, having been nominated for, for a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, in, after that, became uh, an art photographer as well as continuing a freelance photojournalistic and commercial career. And I became acquainted with Rich, I think around 2016 or between 2016 and 2018, I'm not sure, but uh, I saw a great series of his called American Splendor. Um, but I was blown away in 2018 when I saw this body of work that he'll be discussing tonight, Ghosts of Segregation. And I saw that at the Meeting Place Portfolio Review for Artists that PhotoFest does here in Houston every two years. And it was quite a revelation. And when we invited 10 of the reviewers to pick their um, most significant uh, finding from the portfolio review, Mark Sloan, our friend that is the director and chief curator of the Halsey Center for Contemporary Art in Charleston, South Carolina, chose this body of work by Rich. And we were able to show it briefly here in Houston um, in the beginning of March, and it got a great response. So we're excited to be able to get more into it tonight on the digital program. And this is actually a version of a talk that we had planned to take place physically during the biennial. So it really is a translation from our biennial programming into what we're doing now online. Gary Reese is a writer. Um, and among many other things. And uh, he contributed a wonderful first person um, piece of prose for the introduction of, uh, that was included in our biennial guide. It's a, a remarkable piece of work and I was really struck by it. And uh, we all thought how interesting it might be to put these two thinkers together and to investigate the ideas behind Richard's work, but also <clears throat> ideas of institutional segregation uh, that Rich's work is looking at. So we're really looking forward to that happening tonight. I am going to turn it over to PhotoFest Associate Curator Max Fields, and he will introduce Richard and Gary. And um, I'll see you again later at the end of the program. And we will have a Q&A after Rich and Gary talk. So um, 
Thanks again for joining us. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Max Fields, I'm the Associate Curator um, and the Director of Publishing at PhotoFest. And I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce Richard Frischman and Gary Rees for tonight's uh, Creative Conversation program. Uh, Washington-based artist Richard Frischman's work is included in a wide range of private and institutional collections, including the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the New Orleans Museum of Art, and the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth. His work has garnered dozens of prestigious awards, including two Sony, uh, two Sony World Photography Awards in 2018, the Communication Arts Photography Award, the 2018 Photo District News Photo Annual Award, the Photo NOLA Review Award, the Michael H. Kellicutt Award, the International Photo Annual Award, and he was a critical mass finalist in 2012 and 2015. In 1983, he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And Frischman worked as a newspaper photographer in Chicago and Seattle for 11 years. In 1984, he began working as a freelance photojournalist for editorial and corporate clients, including Life Magazine, National Geographic, Sports Illustrated, Time, Microsoft, and numerous others. His current project, Ghost of Segregation, was featured in the PhotoFest Biennial 2020 exhibition 10 by 10. 10 reviewers select 10 portfolios from the Meeting Place 2018. Gary Reese is a writer living and working in Houston. His writing has appeared in multiple museum catalogs, art journals, and magazines, including Art Lies, GlassTire.com, Gulf Coast Literary Journal, Not That This, and the Texas Observer, among many, many others. He has presented his work through lectures and conversations at venues, including the African American Library at the Gregory School, the Art Museum of Southeast Texas, the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston, Rice University, and Texas Southern University. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be a part of this program, and I'm so thrilled that you can all join us. For the benefit of your viewing experience, I do recommend that you turn your Zoom um, viewing platform to the gallery view, because this will be a conversation between uh, these two participants, and it helps to be able to see both of them in the, throughout the talk. Um, do stick around for the Q&A. If you have questions throughout the talk, you can enter your questions in the chat or the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom uh, interface. And if you're on watching this on YouTube, uh, don't hesitate to submit a comment, which we'll also be uh, looking at um, to send to, uh, to ask the questions during the Q&A. And uh, without uh, further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to both uh, Richard and Gary. And thank you again for, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. I was looking forward to talking with Gary at uh, Fotherfest in Houston. And we did talk, but it was over breakfast. We didn't get to have our creative conversation. And, but I learned a lot from Gary. And I, I expect that over the years, I will learn even more. I, I started this project uh, because I've been, I have long felt that our built environment which we don't pay that much attention to generally, reflects our truest cultural selves. I, because we don't pay attention to what it's saying about us. I, I edit what I tell people about me, but I know if you were, if you had a webcam on me as you do now, how did you get this in here anyhow? Um, you would see something else. So as I look at the landscape of America, the culture I'm most familiar with, I um, I look for what it's saying about us, and those places that reflect either our uh, commercialism, our compassion, our uh, sense of humor, our materialism. Uh, that fascinated me for a long time, but. About four years ago, shortly after I met Stephen, um, I started taking another uh, look because I was feeling pretty low about America. I'm sorry to say this, uh, but I expect more from our um, I expect more from our country than the sort of occasional 
white supremacist rants and racism that I witnessed. So I started looking at the built environment to see where those ugly elements came up. And uh, in 2018, I was at PhotoFest and uh, I had just a few pictures at that point from this project, but I was, uh, I, I met with Mark Sloan. I showed him those. I showed him my previous body of work, American Splendor. And uh, we got to talking about places that I might go. We had a, a tremendous intersection. And um, I was, um, I, I left with his advice and the, and the suggestions of a number of critics. Uh, some of the harshest criticism of my work was the most beneficial to me. I spent the next four weeks on the road photographing um, through the South. And uh, I'm, uh, I had done quite a bit of research as I always do before I embark on any project or any shoot, whether it's an individual or uh, a, a larger feature story um, or a project like this, which I expect will last until I die and maybe somebody else will carry on. In any case, I had, uh, I, I had found a number of places I wanted to photograph. And I think, I'll, Max, if you are actually there, can you uh, put up one of the maps maybe? I hope this is working. Good, okay. Thank you, Max. Um, I, on, uh, let me, uh, Max is lurking in the background, which I really appreciate, or uh, Vinod, but uh, I'm not seeing Gary. I just want to know I'm not blathering on alone. I want somebody else to take some heat. Um, anyhow, uh, this map shows, thank you, Gary. I, I wanted your companionship. I wanted you to hold my hand while I do this. Um, so this map on the right shows uh, the places, many of the places that I went to back in uh, 2018. Um, and it, there's so many in the deep south that we had to do an insert. Um, and I photographed extensively in Texas, as you can see. And I have even more I want to shoot. Were it not for um, the coronavirus, I would have just gotten back after three or four weeks on the road, um, going to Tulsa and Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and Little Rock, and all sorts of places that I had identified. Um, can we have the next slide? This, this, should, this may give you a sense of the um, density of, um, I don't know what, racial animus in our country, but I know that it exists even in those places that are just beige uh, at, in, among some individuals, unfortunately. And I, I'm... Uh, I, I want this project, hopefully, to uh, spark conversation among people who are of different backgrounds, honest conversations, so we can move past this. I, I know this is a sort of pragmatic purpose in art, but I can't separate art and politics in my own, my own soul. So um, the next... Uh, slide, please. Uh, I'm asking because I don't have the the clicker in my hand. Um, this the issues of segregation are certainly not past. They're not history. They are current events. All you have to do is turn on, uh, you know, get on CNN or or Fox if you're of that 
mindset or, you know, whatever you can see streaming 24 um, seven evidence of our uh, limitations as humans, I think. Uh, and here's an example of how this ghost is so alive. Um, about two miles from this spot, this is the Browns, Brownsville, Texas border wall, one of the many gates that they have along there. And it's actually set a couple miles back from the Rio Grande. So farmers, American farmers have difficulty accessing their land. Uh, but the point I wanted to make here is that two miles from here, what you're seeing, um, there are 2,500 uh, refugees, primarily from Central America, uh, fleeing drug cartels and violence and hoping to come to the United States for a better life. And um, it, we, it just impresses me how we are so prone to putting up barriers and walls instead of um, really focusing on connection. Um, the, the, uh, the next picture, if we could go to it, is also a Texas uh, scene. It's the very first image that I shot in this, uh, in this series. In 2016, once again, after PhotoFest. My, I, I, I love PhotoFest. It it's, inspires me. Uh, after PhotoFest, I was driving back. I like road trips. I see America that way. I find evidence that way. And uh, I went to Gonzales, Texas, a historic town in the south, I think, of Texas. Um, and the, I was photographing a ghost sign uh, for my previous project. And I was directed to this bar, this saloon, Templin Saloon in Gonzales, Texas, had walls covered with history, uh, but they were knickknacks. What I saw when I walked in was this wall. And I asked the, uh, the bartender, to tell me about it. He spent half an hour giving me a tour and this was the last thing I asked about when he didn't cover it. And he looked at me and he said, that's a segregation wall. I had never seen a segregation wall. And then he said something very touching, I thought to me personalizing this. Uh, he said, my grandmother had to sit behind that wall until the mid 1960s. There's an entrance behind that Dr. Pepper sign. Uh, on that side is where Hispanic people sat. In Gonzales, there wasn't a lot of, um, Afri there were not a lot of African Americans, but there were a lot of Hispanics. And well, during Jim Crow, they were, uh, even and now, you know, they're often, treated as some as the other and i don't know how many of you have ever felt like you're the other whether it's for your political views or your skin color or your religion um your sexual orientation your economics but there are so many ways of us being defined as the other when we're all really one. I mean, we right. may not enter into that easily, but we are. We're all human beings. You know, it's so, really interesting. It's interesting to me because what this wall says to me is it says um, we all think that our particular suffering, our particular uh, bigotry is, is unprecedented, that we're the only one who has experienced something like that. I had a, a neighbor next door who uh, directed me to a, a very much a like sign like that on 75th Street here in Houston. And the sign uh, was a sign that she remembered from the time she was about nine years old. And it said, we don't serve any dogs. We don't serve any 
Mexicans and of course the N-word. And so to see this in Texas and to talk about, you know, the complexities of race within the confines of a single, you know, state is something that, that is very, very, very prevalent. Um, it's just something that I, you know, I don't think that people think about outside of their own particular uh, narrative. You know what I'm saying, Richard? I, um, I think, I think that it, it falls under the auspices of, you know, of bigotry, of racism. It doesn't matter uh, the color or the tenor of, of the particular uh, angle of the, of the voice. It's racism. And so um, that's, you know, th this, is, this is my state. So I, I've seen stuff like this quite a, quite a bit, you know. Here he is an eighth generation Texan. Right. Right. And you I, I, I was fascinated when you talked with me about your life and growing up. It was in Conroe. Yeah. If, if Max could if Max could flip to that slide, I think that would be a good embarking point for me. The one with the, the Crichton Theater. Yeah. Keep going. Keep, keep, keep going. Keep going. One more. You, you're, it's it's you, one more. One more. There. Okay, this this is this is the theater that I grew up um, attending movies at as a kid. Um, but this is a this is a and it's a historical building, and um, Conroe has a really interesting history because Conroe was an oil field town town, and the oil field strike hit about thirty one. So Conroe didn't experience a lot of the depression, you know, that you would experience in the East or the West. Um, in fact, one of the monikers of it was the Miracle City. And George Mitchell made a lot of his money uh, in the Conroe oil fields. So if you could go to the next slide, this is a, a, a and okay, so. This is in 1986. Yeah, go back one more, Max. No, a forward, I'm sorry, forward one more. Okay, this, this is the theater that I knew as a kid. In fact, this is, um, I was, I was eight years old at the time. In fact, this is about the time, one of the last times I went to this theater. If you look at the door on the left, the, the far left, that was the door that we as African Americans had to enter. And I remember probably the last movie I saw in that theater was the original Jungle Book, um, 68, um, and it was just something that was uh, internalized. We knew we were uh, excluded. We were considered uh, the other. It was, that wasn't a popular term then, but it was part of the architecture of um, what was going on in the South. Uh, the board of, uh, the, the Supreme Court mandated the director to uh, uh, the uh, school district in Topeka in 54. Full integration didn't hit my town until 60, 69, about 15 years later. So this was part of the vestiges of what segregation was like in the, in the South. And Conroe was a sundowner town. So it had a heinous reputation as it related to African-Americans and their treatment. Um, and so when I look at the photographs and I relive some of these things and some of these images that I know, in particular this, but also the, the very first one that you had, which was a, the, the hospital at Riverside. I remember that as a kid, um, we would pass by that because I, I had a couple of aunties that were different socioeconomic classes. And so one of them lived maybe about four or five blocks from this hospital, but she lived in what we called the bottom. She was, she was uh, my aunt Lou was a uh, domestic and she lived, um, maybe about six blocks from this. And I remember walking past this, you know, as a kid. Um, and it was always a source of pride because it was a hospital that was given over exclusively to African-American nurses and doctors. And, you know, you were told about it. as someone coming from a rural area, coming to, to an urban area, it was something that, that, um, that you took a lot of pride in. And so to see a photograph like this, for me is a reclamation of, the history of uh, the accomplishments of African America, and it, it provides kind of a foothold uh, in memory for a lot of uh, young people that are coming up uh, now. And so this is a very wonderful photograph for me. 
thank you for for filling in so much. You know, you you know what it's like to live. You have direct knowledge of what the burden of uh, racial animus is, and I have somewhat. Uh, I, though I've experienced religious animus, I you know I I grew up very fortunate. I grew up uh, with parents who let me know how fortunate I was and that yeah. to aspire and, and, to do more. Right. You know, it's really interesting for me to look at these photographs and I see these uh, these boarded up, these bricked up uh, palimpsests and, and to have these kind of conspicuous doors. And it's really interesting the way you take the photographs of some of these doors. It should be a whole series called Conspicuous Doors. You know, <laughs> because because some of the doors, if Max would go through some of the doors on the theaters, um, I find these just incredibly, um, the, the, keep going on some of the theaters. I want to go back to that. But yeah, that's, that's this. Tylertown, okay. Mississippi. Yeah, and it's, it's, the, it's the notion of, for me, of eradicating a memory by simply boarding something up, you know? Um, there was a practice with the missionaries in Africa where they would take a lot of the mask. They would take a lot of what they call the fetishes away um, from these newly uh, euthanized, you know, the proselytes, these newly converted Christians, because they thought that if they took them away, that they would take away the memory of their paganism. And it is almost on the same lines as that. When you have these buildings that are kind of boarded up, um, it, it, it seems to, to play on, on, on the parameters of that same theory for me. You mm -hmm. know? So I, I got a question on when, when the series started, how, how did it start? What was the impetus for it? You had talked about um, the impetus of it, of it starting with the with a, with a conversation, but how did, how did your view change of, 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 or how has it changed as you've continued to take these photographs and, and you examine these places? Well, as I immerse myself in the, uh, the, the topic of inequality, I mean, I think that that's the, the broader issue. Um, I, I, I just see how really complex it is. I, at this moment, we're seeing how um, the, really it goes back to slavery, I think, you know, from which um, segregation arose after uh, uh, after the uh, Reconstruction was um, essentially gutted, and redemption was put in place. The redemption of the South's glory—that's what the redemption phrase means. In any case, I do go on sometimes. Um, the the issues of inequality really are the uh, reflection of that uh, bigoted history that we have of making people second class citizens or worse. Um, so today I saw that uh, in Atlanta, 80% of the patients who've been admitted for COVID-19 to the ho to hospitals in Atlanta are black. They constitute, I think, 32% of the Atlanta population. I, I don't hold me to the numbers other than the 80%. And I, I, I've been reading about this every day, how uh, people who are in poor, areas tend to be of color uh, and they and people who live in poor areas often are in the midst of a food desert so they're eating poorly and they develop diabetes uh, at a, a higher rate than people who are more affluent and that affluence is because uh, people like me had opportunities that other people didn't have as easily. Uh, and I, I'm seeing uh, 
how did, I'm just struck by how there are so many layers uh, and how these this is a web that's quite complex. Um, I now that I've gone off on my tangent, I forgot your initial question, Gary. I, I um, wanted to know how how it, how your how your view. Um, you, you started with the how, emphasis in one direction, and how has that changed as you've gone and you you photographed these particular sites? Has it has it has it opened up? Um, a, a new way of viewing things? Uh, is it opened up a, a different kind of consciousness? Um, you've got like the hanging tree uh, here. I mean, there, there are thousands of hanging trees throughout mm -hmm. the South. Um, how, how are your photo, if, one, of the, one of the other questions I was going to ask, how are your photographs going to um, uh, act as these kind of barometers of where we are um, as a country based on where we've been? as a country? Well, I'm one of the aspects of this, uh, my, in, one of my intentions is to open people's eyes to the history that's around us, okay. whether it's this history, certainly it does not have to be in the South, but it can be anywhere. There are aspects of uh, our history, positive and negative all around us that we often overlook um, those, those uh, theater entrances are easily overlooked uh, as uh, there are so many of them in the South, but I've, I've learned that there's, e there's even at least one segregated entrance uh, in Seattle. I, we, I live mm -hmm. about 30 miles from Seattle mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, uh, I, I was stunned. It wasn't, uh, segregation was not enforced quite like in the South, but I, I've, I've read in different places that it, in some ways it was worse in the North because people who were a minority uh, were, they didn't know what to expect, right. um, but generally it wasn't good. Well, that was, that was it's really interesting you said that because of the photograph of, I think the place in Oregon um, if Max would turn to that, that, that is, is really is, telling. Is that, let me, I'll see if I can find the number of that for Max. It's, is that the brick wall? Um, yeah, where, where it says White House. Uh, white only, yeah. So where is that baby? Um, is it in here? Yes, it is. But if we can talk about, we, we can talk about this piece, which is a, uh -huh. Yeah. Well, if you wouldn't mind, Gary, I'd like to just back up uh, a little bit to that hospital picture, which Max is number uh, five. Yeah, uh, back there. Nope. Okay, there. Okay, yes. Sorry, I said five, but that's because I don't have my glasses on. Um, I... I feel like part of my job is to be an archeologist, I, uh, which is an interest of mine. Uh, I, I like to go out digging for fossils. My wife and son and I have spent a lot of time uh, doing that. These are bits of evidence, traces of our culture mm -hmm. that are easily lost. And when they're lost, I'm not sure that they that heals any wounds, I, I, I'm afraid that it's more likely to allow us to deny what took place or forget what took place. And well, but that's, you know, but, yeah, that's, but that's part, you know, I don't know any other city as well as I do Houston, but I think that's very much a part of what Houston is about. I mean, uh, there was a performance artist named Jefferson Penders who did a reenactment of the Camp Logan incident. Uh -huh. And th that whole, you know, that whole history behind that, uh, which is not known to a great number of people, but it's really interesting to go through that neighborhood and you've got the subdivision named Camp Logan. But I wonder, I really deeply wonder if any of the people really understand all the histories involved with, with that name because attached to the name comes, comes history. And so the same thing with, with this particular um, sign, so to speak, you know, the Houston mm -hmm. Negro uh, Hospital and the School of Nursing, how many people 
would even fathom the idea that there was a nursing school there, that, um, that you trained a whole generation of doctors that did their residencies there. Um, it's something that is kind of lost. You know, and, and one of the photographers in the, in the uh, African cosmology, uh, Sammy Beloji, talked about that with his work, with, 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 with his reclamation of some of the freedom fighters with the Congolese and how he had superimposed them on, the, on some of the, the, the backgrounds that he had. It, it's all about reclamating some kind of history. The question is, how far are you going to take that reclamation? You know, how far are you going to push the, 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 the envelope as it relates to talking about that? And then who's there to talk about it? And who's interested to talk about it? I mean, gentrification kind of wipes away a lot of things in a very, you know, um, nice, neat way. Mo modernity does that. So, you know, one of the things that your photographs do is to keep it constant when you see, and they're large, the scale is, is fairly large, isn't it? Aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these, this one, if printed to its full size, would be about 60 by 60. Okay. But at this point, I don't print that big. It's, it would be 44 by 44. Um, and uh, because I want the detail to be so immersive, when mm -hmm. somebody's standing before the picture, the actual print, which is my ideal, um, that they would feel not that they were looking at a picture, but that they were in that place and really being sucked in by those details. So they might notice things. This particular, I, oh, go ahead. Can I ask you a question? So have you ever shown these photographs to people um, like, you know, in their 80s and 90s or 70s and 80s and 90s and, and to get a response from them? You know, because this is this is like taking I, we had an, I had a great aunt, a great. No. Yeah. A great aunt who lived with me. She was 100 when she passed. And so to try to elicit any kind of memory out of her, we would show her a photograph and we would just sit back. And then the stories would eventually because, you know, the pathway, the pathway to memory, a lot of times is blocked by, by certain things. But when you see an image, an image elicits so much emotion and it, and it clicks back. Um, to so many different things that are that are part of your of your past that are in that room that Freud talked about. And so, have you shown these pictures to to someone in their seventies or eighties or nineties? Well, uh, people it, who are old enough to remember this era, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, yes, they've seen. I know that there have been people who've seen it, but it isn't because necessarily because I've shown it to them. This, I'm glad you asked that question, though, because um, this was the first thing I photographed after uh, PhotoFest 2018. Mm -hmm. I, my, uh, one of my doctors had done his residency at, uh, at Houston General, which is what this hospital later was called. Right. You can see the, you know, the red brick behind it. Yes. Uh, and he, he was sure the sign didn't exist, this place didn't exist. And I asked some people in Houston and they didn't know it. And I've since heard, I don't know if this is true, that this has been torn down. It was definitely derelict and it looked like that was its destiny. So in 2016, I, I worked my way through a cyclone fence to make this picture and um, a woman came up on the other side of the cyclone fence, not inclined to trespass like, like me. And uh, she's, she started uh, shouting, thank you, thank you. Yes. And she, she, her name was Holiday Stone. Yeah. I would guess that she was about 90. Okay. Uh, and she had been born here. And I, I made some notes and quotes uh, of what she had said. I would like to show these to people of that vintage and other people uh, who have experiences and record their comments and maybe shoot video. I see that this is, I, I consider that one of the aspects of the project that needs to be developed. Oh, that's that's one of the major things because we're talking about erasure. We're talking, uh -huh. about, yeah, we're talking about surature. We're talking about things that even as we speak, they're they're being torn down. You know, it's like driving down Third Ward and 
pointing to my daughter. I used to go to a jazz club right there, and, and there's nothing there but a field, you know, that's about to be developed as a condominium or, you know, or a home. Um, and so what, what the project does for me, it, it's, it's a reclamation of, like I said, of things that, that, have, um, that have happened, that have taken place, that we have accomplished as African-Americans, but also of our history as it relates to the buildings um, that we were either on the inside or the outside of, uh, we were treated as first or second class citizens, but the, it's, it's, a, it's amazing work. And I would really like to see a group of people who were, who were um, you know, grew up in that particular neighborhood and to see their responses to, to photographs like this. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, would, it would bring humanity uh, to this project because this is what it's really about. When I, when I photograph these places, I am feeling like an archeologist, but I'm also, I'm thinking about the people. Right. The people who, uh, who suffered here, who had courage or, or pain, uh, and each place is imbued with their spirits. So right. if you could go back, Max, um, Two slides. I'll I'll do this kind of quickly. During the era of Jim Crow, de jure segregation, um, a third of the black population, ch black children in the rural South, got their education at a Rosenwald school. Well, prior to Rosenwald schools, many didn't have access to a school at all. This is a Rosenwald school outside Longview, Texas, uh, in an area that was established by freedmen uh, right after the Civil War. And in 1917, I believe, um, Julius Rosenwald, the president of Sears, began uh, an endowment, a uh, foundation. Uh, he and Booker T. Washington uh, helped fund uh, give seed money to communities of colored people who needed schools. And this one was built. It, this is the second iteration of the Rosenwald School. And by the mid 1960s, um, it was, uh, it had become uh, a warehouse, but because schools were uh, more or less integrated. Um, if you could go to the next picture, Max, um, these Rosenwald schools in, uh, there were once 5,000 of them uh, in the southeast of the United States. Today, uh, there are only 60 buildings approximately that remain. This one was in Eagle River, Eagle Lake, Eagle Lake, Texas, I think. Um, and it was uh, it was torn down just days before I arrived to photograph it. These places are, are, uh, it is erasure, yes. you know, and I, so I feel like part of my job is to photograph these places before they're gone, or if they're gone, to photograph where they were. Right. Or the perspective. Can you go to the one with the church with the benches? I, I want to talk about this. This was the most striking one to me. Uh, one more. No, one more. One more. Yeah. That one. Okay, so these were the benches outside a church that uh, in, in Tuskegee, that, that were outside of Tuskegee, that were, I mean, they're, they're so benign and kind of binoculars looking, but these were the benches where the participants from the Tuskegee, uh, the syphilis uh, experiment would meet the nurse, um, and she would, she would, you know, gauge their, their level of help. Um, I can't remember the numbers of the, of the participants, but I think I want to say 299 or something started. I think a hundred of them died of the, of the disease. Um, about 19 of them infected their wives. And then you had like maybe 43 children that were born, um, with the disease. Um, and, and a, a number of them died of, of other complications. But I mean, to have a photograph like this and then to be able to talk about the history of this particular photograph in relationship to um, the institutional racism 
uh, in America is is a wonderful. I mean, in the in the in the shadow of a church, you know. Mm -hmm. And she would meet them there, and she would she would do her charting um, of of, the, of their progress or their, or their deterioration um, uh, with the disease. That that is an amazing photograph to me. Well, I thank you, thank you for filling in the story on this, Gary. I, as is the case with so many uh, of these vestiges, they're kind of hidden behind a cloak of banality. And uh, so I, I discovered, or I became aware of this uh, when I was doing research for my uh, second road trip through the South. And it, this uh, right next to this scene is uh, Rosenwald School, which is one of my search criteria that I often go to. But I, as I was reading about it, I saw this mention of the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church, right. which is this, being the initial uh, recruitment site for the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. Right. And um, for those of you who don't know, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study was a, a, a federally run uh, program that ran from 1932 to 1972. And uh, it was initially, there were no good treatments for syphilis, uh, but about 10 years after it began, penicillin became available. And the participants in this study were not allowed to receive penicillin. Their healthcare was sort of uh, controlled by the study. And so uh, 100 and I can't, I, well, uh, it, this was not a good thing. Um, so every so often for that period, 40 years, uh, African-American men would come to this, these benches, this tree, and have their blood drawn by Eunice Rivers. Um, you drive by, you don't think about it, but you, I, I want people to think about it. Um, so thank you for, uh, for bringing attention to this. Um, the, let me just, I'm looking over at what we're, um, well, maybe could, maybe at this point, Rich, we can we should start the. Uh, we're running a little behind on time. Maybe we have we? a couple of questions. Did we just start, <laughs> didn't we? Uh, but we we have a couple of questions from the okay, audience great. that are coming in, and uh, I know Stephen has a couple of questions. Stephen, do you wanna do you wanna um, propose your questions to to Gary and Rich? Sure. Um, well, I I wanted to. Mine's a two part question. I wanted to know. When, um, Rich, when, how did you do the research for the project? How did that begin? And then I also wanted to know if you've been collecting any oral histories from the people that you do encounter when you're making the work. Well, I'll answer the last one first because it's easy. Yes, I have been recording oral histories, but only uh, longhand. I, I have yet to uh, record uh, either video or audio, and I want to add that because I think the one of the destinies of this project is a hopefully a traveling exhibit, and I would love to have um, voices, if not faces, of people who lived through this to um, bring that humanity to the story. Um, the um, what was the first part, Stephen? I, I'm sorry. How did, you do the, how did you do the research and how did that uh, begin? Well, that very first picture that I had uh, uh, from this series, which was the Gonzales uh, Dr. Pepper segregation wall. Um, when I presented that a uh, few months after showing it, Malcolm Daniel, uh, 
I was in Santa Fe. I'd met Malcolm before. He saw it and he was sort of taken aback and immediately indicated that he wanted to bring this to his committee for acquisition. And well, that sort of raised a flag for me. Uh, and about... Um, As it would. I'll just yeah. jump in and say, Malcolm Daniel was the curator of photography at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And before yeah. coming to Houston, he was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he's a, he's a, he's a good friend to everyone at PhotoFest. He is, a, uh, he, he uh, was drawn to it because of the topic of segregation. And uh, four days after meeting Malcolm, uh, the election occurred. And that was when I soured on my previous um, project. And I started casting about for where I, what I thought was important to do. And I, uh, over the course of many months, uh, came to the realization that segregation was uh, the issue. I mean, I grew up in the era of the early, uh, the, the early civil rights movement was going on when I was a kid. And uh, I, my parents were really advocates for it. And um, so this seemed natural. I just started, the first thing I did was look up segregation walls, which generally takes you to uh, Jerusalem. But I did find uh, a wall in Detroit. And then as I refined my uh, search methodology, I found other sources that I could use, uh, blackpast.org, a whole number of historical preservation sites. And then I started talking to people, uh, both academics and um, ordinary people. And I'd learn um, from them and go look at what they had to tell me. Um, so I spend, you know, when I go on the road for four weeks, it, it reflects about six months of sitting at my computer or on my phone, um, talking to people and uh, corresponding and looking for where it is that I need to go. Did you pick up some of those skills as a photojournalist? And then if you can just be brief about that, because I, I think there are a number uh, of other questions from attendees. Sure. Yeah, it was, uh, I, I was an annoying child. I asked a lot of questions even <laughs> then. And so I gravitated towards I journalism. can't imagine. Yeah, can I, I know. And you can see a cute child, very cute. Um, I, I gravitated towards journalism and yes, I learned, I developed the skills of improving my research and asking better questions. And, you know, I, so thank you for that because it's, it's really important to me. There are um, two questions that are uh, sort of asking the same thing. And I think they're an interesting question that for both, um, for both you, Rich, and also Gary, I think you'd have an interesting perspective on this. Eric uh, Kunzman asks, can you speak about how you will present this investment that you have in images to make sure that this comes across to the viewers in future generation, this, this um, thinking about the people and the spirits uh, and location in the locations of the, of the photograph? And then Richard Binhammer asks if uh, Rich would speak about the conflict between the beauty of the images and ugly past, which is something that Gary has talked a lot about in conversations between uh, he, Richard, and, and myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it is, it's, the educational aspect of this is probably the most important to me because it's only through that that we can change. The, it's only through education that we can uh, move forward. Uh, and so I have a vision of uh, a traveling exhibition, uh, whether I put it, create it myself or um, get through the auspices of another organization, which would frankly be my preference. Um, and I would like to see a book of this. I, you know, books are 
probably every photographer's dream. They've not really been mine until that dream hasn't been so important to me until this, because I think it's a way of permanently encapsulating uh, the images and easily presenting them with the stories. So to me, you have to have the, you have to know what you're looking at. Why is that important? And it's a struggle uh, online to convey, con to convey that. And I'm not sure how many people in a museum setting would want to stand and read the uh, informational text block. Uh, but if I had video or audio of people talking about it, it could be very powerful. So in answer to Eric's question, Eric, thank you for being there. Um, I like what you're wearing. Uh, the, uh, I, I hope that I'll find a publisher. I hope I'll be able to develop those shows. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful that uh, these pictures are starting to be acquired by museums because I want them to last long past my lifetime. I want this record to be known, just like looking at. Yeah. Can I can I answer can I answer my my thoughts on that? I think that if if you have some kind of recordings that augment them, then they take on the feel of um, the slave interviews. If you ever heard any of the slave interviews from the WPA, I think they add a credence mm -hmm. to yes, and a validity to, to, to the photographs. And I think that um, time is ticking. You know, those people that have that immediate attachment to those particular places, to those enclaves of, of you know, racism, but, but it's really part of their history. You know, um, I think they're, they're slowly fading away. And um, the thing to do, I think, is to find someone who would act as an interviewer who would go along and and and, and find the the people and, and attach them to the places and the stories um mm -hmm. because they're they're out there they they are out there and it, it adds i mean and, and and you're dealing with the video generation my kids are video generate that's all they do i mean they're video and so it's a natural it's a natural fit for them you know um they deal with video a lot better than i know myself probably you you're a photographer but I'm a writer, but they deal with it much better than me, and I think they would be a natural for them. And perhaps well, I happen to know an eligible candidate. Yes, Max, are you volunteering? No, I just well, I was going to say it sounds like Gary's volunteering. No, that's right. um, <laughs> the the question I, I really I'm interested to hear both of your thoughts on this on the tension this question that Richard Benhammer has about the conflict between the beauty of the images and its ugly past. Uh -huh. I think this dichotomy is really interesting. It's something that we've We've talked about a lot. I mean, there's these images are absolutely captivating. Whether they're, uh, it's because they've been, you know, photographed at golden hour with beautiful hues of, of mm. pinks and yellows and and gold, uh, you know, sun rays coming through the image, or the nighttime images where the lights are blasting through the trees. Um, but then, you know, once you're arrested by the spect spectacle, you know, the 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 truth. Um, you know, you're confronted immediately by this like really troubled history. And, you know, Gary, mm -hmm. I know you have some thoughts on this. Oh my God, yes, because, because it, it deals with the complexities of memory. And, and, what, and, and when you're um, confronting memory, you know, how honest are you? How, how I mean, and, and which stories are gonna bubble up to the top, you know, and, and which ones take precedent? Are, are they the stories that, that are the most appealing commercially? Or are they the stories that really get at the heart of the man? It's like history. I mean, memory is history. I mean, which history do you believe? Do you believe the, um, the emotive history or do you believe the history of academia? You know, I, I, you and I have talked about this a great deal. I say that it's some kind of algorithmic kind of blending between those two and you figure out a place in that liminal ground on, on something that, that is not comfortable, but something that deals with all different aspects because history and memory come from above and below and the left and the right. And so when I look at the photographs, it's like, my God, I mean, I, I really want to hear the stories behind them. That gives me a perspective. And then I sit up and then I look and say, okay, what is your history as it relates to that? Or do you have a history? Or do you know someone who has a history as it relates to that? Um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's a slippery slope, Max. It's a really slippery slope. I, I wonder, Max, if you could, 
uh, if you have the remote control, mm -hmm. if you could slide over to, I think it's image 29. It's uh, an exterior at sunset because I'm looking at what I sent uh, in the there. Yeah. Oh, the internment camps. This yeah. Internment so, camp? yeah. yeah, so this, you know, this was a beautiful scene in my mind and I knew yeah. that I was depicting something horrible. This was, this is um, another aspect of our checkered history. Um, during World War II, as everybody knows, uh, we incarcerated uh, 125,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast were transported to uh, inland, uh, remote inland uh, prisons, essentially, quickly constructed, often in the worst uh, environments. This is at Minidoka, outside Twin Falls, Idaho. And very few buildings from uh, uh, original buildings exist. Any, any of the internment camps. At Manzanar, the only one, the only original structure is a, a memorial in the cemetery. Uh, but this, this is uh, the last uh, uh, original barracks in uh, Minidoka or in the whole system that I'm aware of. Um, many have been returned and are being restored, but they've been changed. So I, I wanted to make this irony of the beauty of the moment, uh, the light coming through the windows and the sky and the sort of wild roses with the fact that this is a place where 8,000 souls, probably over 6,000 of them were actually born in the United States. American citizens where they were incarcerated for much of World War II. And if you go to the picture before that, Max, to this is what they were living in. This is a, a bar an actual family living quarters in a barracks, same barracks, uh, not so pretty. So I, there are um, often, ironic juxtapositions of like in this series, I have a, a Negro League uh, ball field, a place of, uh, uh, you know, pleasure, but not. And uh, I, I just want to open people's eyes to the evidence around us and I'll help guide people to the extent that I can and often, you know, those beautiful places have some uh, ugly truths to tell us. But, but but don't you think that that this is like this is like the the the, the real America, in a sense, you know? Unfortunately. Yeah, in in a yeah. sense, don't you think it's kind of like it's kind of like um, you know, I, I'm into I'm into the blues and and stuff like that and and and. Um, there are a number of songs that the railroad guys would, would sing, the Gandhi dancers. And I assume that, that most of them were African-American. Well, guess what? You had Russian Gandhi dancer songs, you had Scottish Gandhi dance, you had Chinese. And so I think we have been, we've been misled to think that it's one way when in actuality, America is really made up of, um, most of the people that have come here have been poverty stricken, um, They've been indentured. They've been slaves. Those are really the people that make up America, for me. Um, mm -hmm. Marginalized you know, in oh, yeah, every oh, way possible. In every way possible, Stephen. Um, but it's just the it's the history is presented from the viewpoint of um, you know of the elites, and so I think it is left up to us to reclaim that and to present these these histories of this particular type. You know. Well, well said. Thank you, Gary. Do you, uh, do you all have any final thoughts before we wrap this up tonight? I, I, I'm, I'm shocked that time has flown. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that, uh, I hope that people will look around where they live and look for traces 
of history, whether it's um, something as painful and ugly as this, which needs remediation immediately, uh, or if it's something more benign. Uh, I'm just, I, I love the fact that there are these these nuggets and um, that's what I, that's what I hope. I just I just want people to to um, to be aware and and to um, make an effort to to investigate things because things are, are are falling off and things are being omitted and elided. I mean, under your very eyes, and you have no idea. Um, and to talk to a young person and to tell them about that. That's my, that, those are my only wishes. Well, Richard and Gary, thank you both so much for joining us tonight and for speaking about this work. It was incredibly illuminating to hear your thoughts. And I'm so, so glad that we were able to share this work with people um, despite, you know, the postponement of our, of this conversation from, from gosh, March. Yes. Well, it feels mm -hmm. like a year ago. And I want to also thank everyone who was able to join us today for this Zoom conversation. Um, this conversation is recorded and will be archived on PhotoFest's YouTube uh, channel. So you can subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find this conversation for your review. And if we didn't get to your question tonight, um, do use the Facebook event um, to send your questions. And you know, I'm sure that Richard and Gary would be happy to uh, follow up with you because we had amazing questions and I'm so sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but I wanna thank everyone again for coming out. I wanna thank Richard, I wanna thank Gary, Stephen, Vinod, and everybody at PhotoFest for making sure that this happened. It's really wonderful. And Max, I have some closing thoughts, but um, one of them really brings it home to how um, this touches everyone in America. Um, our uh, Literacy Through Photography Advancement Director, April Frazier, texted uh, during the conversation to say that the Negro Hospital was where my great-grandfather died. My father was born the day he died and has his name. I was born there once it became Riverside General Hospital. That's what I remember. Uh, yeah, in Riverside. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, it, um, it's... Uh, gave me chills a little bit. Um, yeah. and it's all so connected. Um, and I want to thank both of you, Richard, Gary, for a fascinating discussion uh, and thank the audience for the participation and the thoughtful questions. And we're really excited to continue this important work of the PhotoFest Biennial in this way. The move to a virtual space for PhotoFest is new and we really appreciate the enthusiasm that the audience has for it and that the staff has for it as we've embarked together on these new platforms. We've been really encouraged by the response and we plan to continue these platforms long after social distancing is a memory, um, which can't come, so. come soon enough. Um, we've got a lot more planned and as Max said, uh, we hope you'll join us for future programming uh, the events are posted on the PhotoFest website at www.fotofest.org, photofest.org, and on our social media platforms uh, on Facebook and Instagram. The next program that we have uh, live, the live digital program will be Saturday, May 2nd at noon U.S. Central Time, and we're going to present a creative conversation talk with uh, African Cosmologies artist, Laura L. Tantawi. Um, she'll be coming in from Egypt. So that's why it's at the early hour uh, at noon. And um, we're really excited about that. Max and I will conduct a conversation and present a screening of her short film, In the Shadow of the Pyramids, a poetic meditation on her experience growing up in Egypt during this time of social, cultural, and political change. Then on the evening of Wednesday, May 20th, I'll conduct a conversation with photographer David Johnson and his collaborator, uh, poet Philip Matthews. And uh, that work's featured also in the 10 by 10 exhibition that Rich's work it has been included in. And the two artists will discuss their practices, their collaborative project, Wig Heavier Than a Boot, 
and uh, we'll get to know uh, about how this fascinating project came about. Um, so we look forward to talking about that too. So um, again, thanks everybody. Have a great night. And um, Rich, Gary, Max, thank you so much. I, I was really thrilled to, to see this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all for being here.